We have as our guest today, Member of Parliament, Simeon Brown and National Party spokesperson for Transport and Public Service. Good afternoon, Simeon, and thank you for having made the time to be with us today. Good this afternoon, joint... Thank you very much, Simeon. This is a joint discussion co-hosted by the Indians Living in Auckland Facebook group and readers of the Indian Newslink newspaper and its editor, Mr. Venkatraman. Indians Living in Auckland provides members of the Indian community with a live platform and a forum to talk, ask questions and be heard. We provide them with a collective voice. We hold these live discussions once every month with an important guest, Simeon. Before every discussion, we throw all the floor open to our members and ask them to send us their questions. We pick the most frequently asked questions. Simeon, we're really looking forward to an informative discussion with you today. Over to uh, you, Venkat. Thank you. Simeon, um, great to have you with us. You know that um, you're my favorite MP and you are my MP from Pakuranga. What's on the uh, record now, Venkat? It's a privilege to be living in this uh, part of Auckland uh, for the last 23 years. And uh, we have seen with pride your growth. For those who have not heard of Simeon Brown in the past, Simeon is one of our very young members of parliament. He started his career after graduating from the University of Auckland. He worked for the Bank of New Zealand. And then he started with the Mano River Council. He went over there and then he progressed from there. And in 2017, he was chosen to represent the Pakaronga constituency to succeed Maurice Williamson, who was a member of parliament for about 300 years from there. And um, so when he was chosen, uh, uh, Simeon was just 25 years old. That made, made him one of the youngest members of parliament that we have had in New Zealand. And over the last five years, he has had a number of roles within the National Party. He was a spokesman for police in the past, and today he handles two important uh, portfolios for the National Party. One is transport, which uh, in fact encompasses uh, much of infrastructure for New Zealand. And the second is public service. Many people do not speak about public service because it's not a subject that's often discussed. But Simeon has an important role to play because public service is an integral part of growth and development of any country. And as you know, public service encompasses a range of services and facilities. And it also um, goes across to public service projects, public projects and so on. So we welcome Simeon. Thank you for your time. And um, before we move on to questions, I believe we've got a number of questions. Uh, most of them or all of them relate to your portfolio. What we do, Simeon, is to retain the integrity, the meaningfulness and the usefulness of this discussion. We, we request our patrons, the members of the group and readers of Indian Newslink to confine their questions to the portfolios to which either the ministers who come in or members of parliament who come in to the discussion because it makes their jobs easier. You are the masters of the portfolios that you represent and it's only fair that we ask you questions relating to your areas. So with that, Simeon, we have great pleasure in welcoming you. Uh, can I invite you to make an opening statement? Thereafter, we can move into questions. Thank you, Simeon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Venkat and Rushna, for that very warm welcome. And can I just start by thanking you for this opportunity to um, speak to you and to all of your uh, viewers and listeners um, and to acknowledge the very important role that the Indian Newslink plays in New Zealand, um, making sure that uh, our vast and growing Indian community uh, is able to be a well-informed uh, to be able to stay connected with the issues of the day, uh, but also to have a really important role in making sure that their voices are heard when it comes to the debates and the issues which matter to all New Zealanders. And uh, 
I just want to acknowledge you, Venkat, you are uh, a wonderful uh, person here in East Auckland, but also Rushna. Uh, you both play a critical role here in East Auckland and in the community that uh, I am so fortunate to represent. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, it's a real privilege and honour to, to be here, and I look forward to answering uh, your questions this afternoon. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Rashna, please carry on. And Lovely, I will. I will. Simeon, just to let you know, the Facebook group that you know we're talking about, Indians Living in Auckland, we are at the moment 58,000 members of you know in the Indian community living in Auckland. And it, it sort of provides a platform where you can talk and ask any question that you want. Um, I'm one of the main moderators there. We put up, you know, stories of interest every single day about things back home and things in New Zealand that we feel members should know, should be aware of. It's also where people post their own things about, you know, they have a job to offer the community or, you know, they themselves seeking a job or service. So it keeps us all, you know, sort of, you know, communicating with each other and well bonded as a community. So we really, you know, appreciate what the group does for us. And of course, with, with the, you know, collaboration that we now have with Venkatji, and the Indian News Link, we're able to bring, you know, distinguished speakers like yourself in front of our audience. So thank you once again. And I'm just moving on to my questions now, if you're okay with that. Venkaji, I'm starting my first question. Simeon, if you are appointed the Minister for Transport next year, what will be your five priority tasks? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, as the National Party uh, spokesperson for transport, uh, it's my job to advocate for uh, the area which I think impacts everybody's life when it comes to transport policy. Uh, we all have a need to get around, um, and that need uh, comes in many different ways. And so it's important that we recognise uh, those variety of ways that we get around. I think, firstly, what we need to do when it comes to transport is we need to make sure that we get on and get things done. And I fear that over the last uh, four and a half years, there's been lots of talk around big transport projects. We've heard a lot of talk about Auckland Light Rail in Wellington. Let's get Wellington moving. Uh, but unfortunately, many of the big projects which need to be done uh, are, being, uh, are, not, are not happening with many cancellations. So I would like to see us actually get back and get back and focus on delivery rather than simply talking about big projects which cost a lot of money and may not ever happen. The other thing that needs to happen is there needs to be stopping the waste. Uh, we've seen $51 million uh, wasted on a cancelled cycle bridge here in Auckland, which I think most Aucklanders think is crazy. Um, but people might not realise there's still an empty office on the waterfront for the people who are meant to be designing uh, that cycle bridge. Uh, this sort of waste needs to stop. We need to use your petrol tax money uh, that you pay uh, when you drive around to get it going back into transport investment um, and make sure that we get things done. People are complaining about the quality and the maintenance of our roading system. And I think that's a very fair point. I'd like to see less wasted and more actually invested uh, in actually getting things done. And then I think we need to make sure that we're actually delivering the quality infrastructure that people need. And that's going to come in a variety of different uh, modes, particularly in a big city like Auckland. Uh, people need to be able to drive around in their cars. That's the reality of life in Auckland. But we still also need to continue to invest in public transport. And so National is very proud of our investment in the city rail link, which is currently under construction. That's going to double the capacity of our rail network in Auckland. Uh, so we need to make sure that when that comes online, uh, Auckland is able to use it and utilise the benefits that come from it and also make sure that we can continue to get around with our cars, keep moving freight around our city as well. Um, and that means making sure that we're also investing in a good roading network. So those are a number of my priorities, but obviously uh, we'll have a lot more to say um, closer to the election about what specifically uh, we want to see done uh, in Auckland, but also across the, uh, the entire of New Zealand. Lovely. Thank you very much, Simeon. Wenkat, anything you'd like to add there? I think um, I would suggest that we go through the questions because some of the questions which I may have for Simeon may be coming through from our listeners and members of the group. Uh, if there is anything left out, then I will 
request the per, your permission to ask those questions. Certainly. Let's carry on with the okay, questions lovely. we have. Simon, on to my next question. Will a national party-led government scrap the city rail project in Auckland and Wellington? This comes from a member who lives in Wellington, and he says, I live in Wellington and do not want all the disruption that comes with these projects. Mm. Well, the, 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 the city rail link, which is a project which is already under construction, was started uh, by the National Party when we were last in government. Uh, that project we want to see come to completion, uh, and it will come to completion in coming years. The question might be asking actually around the Auckland Light Rail project. Uh, and then the Let's Get Wellington light rail project, which is being proposed by the current Minister of Transport and the Labour government. And we've, we've made it very clear, we don't think those projects stack up, um, particularly the light rail component of those projects um, in Auckland and in Wellington. Um, they, come, they stack up very expensively without actually having the necessary benefits uh, to be able to actually make them uh, be justified from a taxpayer's perspective. The Auckland Light Rail project is expected to cost $29.2 billion. And whilst everyone knows that infrastructure costs a lot of money, um, the question needs to be asked, is a project which is only going to benefit around 10% of Aucklanders uh, and costing $29.2 billion actually in the best interest of Auckland, but also the interest of all New Zealanders, um, noting that that's going to cost around $16,000 per household from someone living in uh, Kaitaia, or Invercargill or in Auckland. Uh, you know, most Aucklanders won't even be near that route. So we've said, look, actually, that project doesn't make sense. But what we do see a need for is greater investment in public transport initiatives across uh, across Auckland. And so we'll have more policy closer to the election around what that looks like. And then again, in Wellington, the light rail part of the Let's Get Wellington initiative, Let's Get Wellington moving initiative, again, doesn't stack up. Um, we see a need for there to be a really good uh, connection between the Wellington CBD and Mitama and the airport. Um, currently, the government's proposal doesn't actually unlock the congestion in Wellington, which then would allow for better public transport, better walking, better cycling uh, to actually happen within that CBD. And so we're saying, actually, let's do these things properly. Let, sometimes you actually need to invest in busting congestion so you can actually give uh, the ability for better public transport to actually work. And so that's that's what our focus will be. And so we'll have some more to say on that closer to the election, but we can certainly say that light rail part of those projects doesn't stack up from what, what we see at the moment. Wonderful. Uh, Krishna, one minute. Can I ask you, Simeon, Wellington seems to be, uh, the situation there is getting worse as far as mm. traffic is concerned. And every time I go there, I find the uh, increasing congestion uh, in Wellington, uh, there are problems, as you know, within the council, Wellington Council, they're not able to progress on some of these infrastructure projects. And I had taken this up with our friend Andy, Andy Foster there. Um, but it looks like the central government might have to step in mm. to, uh, to improve the infrastructure within Wellington. But because from as as I can see, um, there's real um, problem in Wellington, some of the areas, and yes. people are experiencing same kind of uh, bottlenecks as uh, Aucklanders are experiencing. So if you don't intervene now, Simeon, I'm afraid that over the next 10 or 15 years, Wellington will begin to suffer uh, a poor transport structure. That's right, Ben Kett. And the reality is the government's proposal doesn't actually, doesn't actually benefit congestion in Wellington. So the the route between the CBD and the airport will remain through Mount Victoria only one lane each way for general traffic. They're not planning to improve the number of lanes to actually try and bust that really key arterial uh, through that area. So what actually needs to happen is that that congestion needs to be busted and central government does have a role to play. That's why Nas National originally set up the Let's Get Wellington Moving program mm. uh, to try and get the councils and the government aligned uh, on what needed to be done. But unfortunately, uh, since Labour came to office, they've spent four and a half years, they've spent $41 million on consultants. Nothing's actually happened other than they've decided to put another pedestrian crossing uh, along the road between Wellington CBD and Wellington Airport. 
um, and lower the speed limit. So the only things that are done to let's get Wellington moving is to actually let's slow it down. Um, it's quite ironic. So we're absolutely um, clear that there's, something needs to happen. We set up let's get Wellington moving to get that done. It's unfortunately stalled um, in the last four and a half years. And, um, and I don't see any delivery happening. In fact, even the government's own funding doesn't kick in until 2028. There'll be two more general elections and three more local body elections before then. Um, and that just shows that there's really no commitment from this government to actually fix those problems. What about the transmission gully? Would, would you like to have some of those come in? Well, if the transmission gully was a, a one of part of one of New National's roads of national significance, and um, when you go and drive that road, you see what how transformational that has been to Wellington and to the Lower North Island. Uh, you know, the Hamilton Expressway, the Hamilton section of the Waikato Expressway just opened this last week, another of National's roads of national significance. And they're, and they're not just roads, they're about connecting our regions so that people can move more freely, uh, that freight, particularly freight and logistics are able to be connected between our ports and where the industry and where our agricultural base lies in our, in our regions. And that's what's going to transform uh, New Zealand. So we actually need to be investing in those connections. So look, again, we'll have a lot more to say about this closer to the election, Ben Cat. Thank you. Thank you, Simeon. Thank you. Venkat, may I move on? Yeah, please go ahead. Lovely. Now, this, this question has been answered, you know, quite extensively by you. But we actually had this question from, you know, a, a member of, you know, our group. And that was with, you know, concern to let's get Wellington moving project. If you think this is not necessary, how will you stop it moving forward? Mm. Well, I guess the key thing is, as I said earlier, um, the government really doesn't have much commitment other than making an announcement. Uh, they've made an announcement, but none of the funding kicks in until 2028, which is six years away. And uh, between now and then, there'll be two elections. Uh, we hope to win the 2023 election if New Zealanders um, support us and choose to elect us. Um, and that means we'll be able to uh, affect some real change. And uh, we'll certainly have more to say about that and what that might look like closer to the election. Lovely. So, I mean, when you're the next transport minister, would you commission a train service between Botany, Howick, Manukau, and Pemio? You know what the situation is for people <laughs> living within those areas. What would be your take on that? Look, that's a that's a great question, and it's a it's a topic that gets raised with me from time to time. Um, being the member of parliament for Pakuranga and being a living in East Auckland myself, uh, and the question is, should you know, should we have rail out here into into East Auckland? I mean, the reality is. Um, what, what is being done in East Auckland is the Eastern Busway. Uh, it's a project which was started under the, under the previous national government. Um, and it's going to deliver a, a high quality bus rapid transit from Panmure through to Botany, and then eventually uh, down to the airport via Botany. Um, so that ultimately will become the, the route which will uh, service East Auckland and give East Auckland greater public transport access and public transport choices. Um, the good news about it is it's actually a, in addition to the current lanes on those roads. So where it's going to go from Pakaranga through to Botany, there will be additional two lanes built for that bus route to be able to go along that route. It also includes the Reeves Road flyover, which will connect Pakaranga Road through to the uh, southeastern arterial, which will ease congestion around the Pakaranga Plaza. So it's a great project. Um, we're very supportive of it, uh, and we want to see it. We want to see it get done. Um, and particularly, I think a lot of people are saying that Reeves Road flyover needs to be done done as soon as possible um, to ease that congestion around that Pakuranga Plaza. So that's uh, that's where we, that's what we're supporting, and and we're 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 um, keen to get get uh, get done. Excellent, Simon. Why cannot we build a metro connecting all the suburbs of Auckland? How can we compare our transport services? with Sydney or Melbourne when we do not even have a good network? Mm. Well, it's a, it's a good question. And I think, firstly, I'd just say, as we pointed out earlier, National invested in the City Rail Link, which is a project which is going to mean that the capacity of our rail network in Auckland can effectively double. 
And so that's, a, that's going to make a huge difference to our public transport network across Auckland. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily add another rail line uh, into another part of um, Auckland, but it does substantially increase um, the capacity of that network. And it's going to allow for far more development around those train stations. Uh, more people can live near those train stations and be able to use uh, the public transport system on that rail, that rail system, which is already there. And that's gonna make a significant difference. The, the, the other point I would make though, is our populations are not the same as Melbourne or Sydney. Um, so those are cities which have you know, populations greater than the entirety of New Zealand. And so when it comes to what does the public transport network of the future look like, we certainly wanna see greater investment, um, but we also need to be realistic about what's affordable um, and what can, what's actually gonna make the most difference to as many people. And so the Northern Busway is a great example of a, of a bus route, which is effectively carrying a significant number of people into the city from the North. Eastern Busway is another example, which will happen out East. Uh, are the, what, what other options are required across Auckland? Um, so we're looking very clearly at that. The government's answer is, well, we're gonna spend $29 billion on uh, one route between uh, the CBD and Mount Roskill, and then further down to Mangere. Now, ultimately that doesn't stack up. It's only costs you know, $16,000 per household across New Zealand and only benefit about 10% of Aucklanders. And so that's not going to improve public transport in the West. Uh, that's not gonna improve public transport to the North. It's not gonna improve public transport to the East uh, and for most of the South of Auckland as well. So we have to take a look at what is actually needed across our city. Uh, to make sure that we get those real benefits for everybody. And so that's what we're looking at. And there'll certainly be more that we'll have to say about that closer to the election. Can I ask uh, Simeon something more on this? Please do go ahead, Venkat. Uh, Simeon, sometime in 2001, there was a proposal which was not very widely discussed. That was for a private initiative to come in to build either a metro or a uh, or a better transport network in Auckland based on two factors. One is there would be an overseas investment and there would be a toll fee and the toll fee would be collected by the overseas investor or the local government and the central government will impose a toll fee just as we have in America. And then I don't know the success of what the fee is when uh, we move to North Island Beyond Auckland, when you go to Silverdale and other places, there's a road toll to be played. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what happened to that scheme. In case, if you require money is, an op is, is one of the challenges that the city mm -hmm. faces, would you be interested in inviting foreign investment into uh, infrastructure in Auckland? Look, I think the um, the national gov national governments in the past and the national party has always been open to foreign investment and infrastructure, and uh, and we supported um, public private partnerships to be utilised for the building of roads, and I think we'll certainly see uh, a very a very much an openness to that um, going forward. Of course, it all does depend on what the project is, uh, what the funding model would be. Um, and we'll certainly be uh, be looking towards that as we as we as we develop our policies going forward. Okay, so perhaps we can carry on this discussion at some other time because uh, I think this requires a wider uh, thinking uh, if we have to have a, a long term plan for Auckland. Thank you, Rashna. My next question, you, you've answered most of it, Simeon. You've told us your thoughts on the millions that are being spent on the cycleways all over Auckland. If that money could be spent more wisely, where do you think that money should go? Look, I think um, if you look at what's being spent across Auckland, uh, I think the, the, the worst example of um, a proposed cycleway was the uh, Auckland Cy Harbour Cycle Bridge, which was suggested. The, the crazy thing about it is the government actually spent $51 million um, on consultants uh, on a project they then decided to cancel because Aucklanders stood up in arms and said, actually, that's an absolute waste of money. It's not going to benefit very many people. But look, that doesn't mean that investing in cycleways isn't important. Uh, people get around in a, in a variety of ways. 
But I think what most people would say is actually there needs to be a, a sensible expenditure when it comes to these things. And if you look at Auckland Council, uh, they now want to spend billions of dollars on cycleways um, over the next number of years. Uh, and, by, and, and to do that, they want to reduce the amount of road space there is on our roads, uh, which will only make congestion worse. I think what New Zealanders want to see is good use of their money on projects which make sense and which can be built efficiently, quickly, um, and also which, go, which don't disrupt and make the traffic worse. And so look, that's I think where we would be coming from when it comes to that investment. Um, but again, look at the Eastern Busway. I think that's a great example where uh, we're building a, we're maintaining the, the, the road capacity, we're increasing public transport, uh, but we're also making better walking and cycling possible out here in East Auckland. And so there's a benefit for a variety of mode users. And so I think that, that certainly does make sense. Absolutely. Now moving on to your other portfolio, public service. Well, Our public well, service from health to education and local government has been on the decline. What will you do as a minister to improve these? Well, look, that's a really good question. And the public service portfolio, as I think you pointed out earlier, or Ben Cat may have, is not one which most New Zealanders sort of wake up in the morning and think about, um, but it's actually a critical, uh, critical role. They think about the police, they think about healthcare, they think about education, uh, they think about their, their local services, uh, but they don't think about the, the, the public service component which sits behind a lot of those uh, departments and, and functions that the government has. And so the public service has a critical role in making sure that this, the money that New Zealanders pay in, a, in our taxes, in our rates, uh, in our levies, uh, is put to good use. And the point I would make is that I don't see it going into good outcomes at the moment. Over the last four and a half years, there's been uh, 14,000 additional bureaucrats hired in Wellington. It's up from 48,000 to 62,000 backroom bureaucrats. Uh, that's costing New Zealanders around $1.7 billion more per year. But New Zealanders would want to know, well, what's the benefit that's being received from all of that extra expenditure and all those additional people? Because if there is a, a benefit, uh, I think most New Zealanders would look at it and go, actually, well, we can see that. But when you look at the statistics, if you look at crime, there's been a 40% increase in gang membership, a 20% increase in violent crime. If you look at the state house wait list, it's now up four times what it was to 21,000 people waiting on the uh, on the, the public state house waiting list. We're spending $5 billion more in education, uh, but 40% of our children aren't going to school regularly. Uh, and in, in health, uh, when we left office, there were 984 people waiting uh, more than four months to see a specialist, and now that's over 14,000 people. And all of those statistics, people would say, well, COVID has certainly got in the way. And I think there's some truth to that, and that COVID has impacted and disrupted. But all of those statistics were getting worse before COVID even hit New Zealand. They were getting worse under this government, and they've got worse since. And so what the priority in the public service needs to be is getting government expenditure under control, and then having it focused on outcomes and frontline services rather than backroom office staff. And I just look at NZTA, which is, you know, the New Zealand Transport Agency, which looks after our state highways and has an important role around our transport. You know, they've, they've increased their number of staff significantly. They've got three times as many communication staff. Uh, I'm not sure why they need over 90 communication staff when that money should be going into actually investing in our roads. Uh, we're seeing this across our government departments, and that's very concerning to me. So I want to make sure we get our government departments back focused on outcomes, frontline services, and actually investing in New Zealand so that we get better outcomes for everybody. Excellent. My next question connects to the one that you've just answered. And when you are Minister for Public Service, what are the most important five changes that you will make to access and improve service delivery? Look, I think it's a really good question. I think what we want to be focused on, as I said, is, is, is around outcomes. And so when we were in government, we had at last, we had a very clear 
uh, message to the public service around targets and what they had to measure against to make sure they were actually delivering on the outcomes that New Zealanders had for them. And so whether that was in health, we had uh, targets around uh, how quickly someone had to be seen when they went to an emergency department, um, how long they could be waiting on a wait list to see a specialist or to get a hip operation. We had targets around if you had a burglary, police had to turn up within 48 hours to your property to, to investigate. We had targets that, in education around improving NCA outcomes. And so all of these things have now been dumped by this government. And since then, they've started getting worse because they're not getting measured against. And so we're certainly going to have a lot to say around how we want to see uh, that be better measured, uh, but also see those targets actually being achieved, because that will drive better outcomes for New Zealanders. I think the other point is we want to see a much more careful expenditure of public money. Every single dollar of taxpayers' money should be spent as if it's your own. At the moment, we're seeing money spent like it's no, like it grows on trees. Uh, and and we, <laughs> we all know it doesn't grow on trees. You know, the wastage that we're seeing in terms of the increased amount being spent on projects which go nowhere. Um, we're seeing the examples of, you know, NZTA doing a $25 million office fit out for a flash new office down in Wellington. Uh, people, people look at it and go, well, we're living in a cost of living crisis here. Is that actually what I want to have my money being spent on at the moment? And so the absolute priority for me, uh, if I was the, if, I, if we're elected and I'm the public service minister, will be around outcomes, efficiency, and making sure that uh, every single dollar of taxpayers money is spent wisely. Excellent. I've got a question here, Simeon. May I, Rashna? Yes, please, Venkat. Simeon, maybe when you are when you become a minister for public service, it might be worthwhile in the long term perspective to consider establishing a public service, um, not the public service commission. We already have that, but in terms of service delivery like the good old civil service, if you like, in the in the United Kingdom. And mm -hmm. you have a similar service, administrative service in India, which is a huge resource of people which attract talent. And those are the people who really run the administrative machinery, helping parliamentarians and politicians to concentrate on policies and programs. And mm -hmm. they really run the government machinery according mm -hmm. to the policies and programs of the party in power. We don't seem to have either of uh, a civil service or a foreign service. We, we do have a public service commission, which largely restricts or confines itself to interviewing and recruiting people on behalf of government, but not necessarily to run the machinery. If you take today's administrative setup, you've got bureaucrats, some of them don't even know what they're supposed to do. And they do not share the kind of ambition that the politicians have. So perhaps it's time for New Zealand to consider setting up of an administrative machinery. You need a college which will train people. You need policies, programs. You must encourage people to um, cooperate with you in writing policies and programs and not leave it to research institutes. I don't know whether I've come through with my point, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that to have a permanent machinery which trains itself and improves talent over the next, I mean, for the future generations, this is what I believe is important. Mm. Look, I think you make some good points there, Venkat. I mean, ultimately, we have an independent uh, public commission and a public service, and it needs to remain independent. Um, it needs to be focused on giving ministers and officials uh, free and frank advice, and I fear that that is becoming disrupted. Um, but I think also you make a really good point. We actually want to attract good talent into those positions. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. And I think over the last few years in particular, it's simply been about growing and unmitigated growth. It's just been ballooning in size. And that doesn't necessarily mean better people focused on better outcomes. Um, that's what all we're seeing there is we're seeing that constant ballooning. And so, you know, the people in the public service are working hard, but the government policies which are put in place are not being uh, not being measured and not being targeted. 
and that means unfortunately the government departments are simply growing without there being that restraint which I think taxpayers need at the same time. Yeah, okay. I think we need to have a further discussion on this because I am very um, ambitious about improving public service in New Zealand and I believe we can do well. Uh, it, it can be very complementary to Public Services Commission and it can be totally independent of the government in, uh, of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, you will attract good talent, uh, Simeon. Well, let's have a coffee about that, shall we, Venkat? Sure. Thank you, Simeon. We will certainly do that. Thank you. Venkat, would you like me to move on? Yeah, please carry on. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, Simeon, as the MP elected from Pekaranga, what are your plans to improve the area, the landscape, the facilities, and the utilities? As someone living in the area, both Venkat and I, and a number of our members, Obviously, this was, you know, a question that most of us wanted to ask you. Oh, look, that's a that's a good question. And oh, look, firstly, I think East Auckland is a wonderful place to live and raise a family. And I think many people move out to East Auckland because a uh, beautiful environment. Um, it's got wonderful schools, uh, very high quality schools, um, but also it's a very peaceful part of Auckland. And I think that's um, those are the things which attract people um, to East Auckland. And so I think it's really important we retain those good qualities uh, in our community, but that doesn't mean we also have an, a, a number of challenges facing uh, East Auckland. And since I've been elected MP, I've certainly been very focused around the, the challenge of transport, uh, very much advocating for the Eastern Busway and the Reeves Road flyover, because I think that's one of the biggest frustrations that uh, I hear from all the time is we keep paying all these petrol taxes, uh, but we actually haven't seen the investment that we need. And so we're very focused on uh, making sure that that happens. We also need to make sure that we uh, continue to, to care for our environment. And, you know, we've got some of the most beautiful uh, beaches and environment out here in East Auckland. And so I've been a very big supporter of, of that as well. Um, and, and noting that um, the local community board, the Howick Local Board, um, does a lot of good initiatives in that space as well, making sure that our parks and our reserves are well maintained um, and the, the playgrounds are upgraded um, and that those facilities are, are, are really as good a quality that they can be. Um, the other point I'd make is that um, whilst East Auckland is primarily a suburban community, um, we do have some big industries as well through East Tamaki um, and other parts. And it's important that we uh, it's important we have a government which backs our businesses. Um, East Auckland is full of entrepreneurs and business people um, who work really, really hard. And so backing our business people, uh, supporting them with policies which make it easier for them to deal with government, easier for them to be able to start businesses, hire people, um, and to be able to trade. All of those things are policies that I'll continue to advocate um, because I know they benefit people big time here in East Auckland. Um, who and helps them get ahead. And the final point is around education. And you know, I've always supported our local schools because I know that's such a big part of attracting people out to our part of Auckland. Um, I'm incredibly proud of all of our local schools. And it's really important that our schools are able to act um, under the Tomorrow Schools framework so that they're able to be independent, they're able to um, have their own identity. Um, and they're able to continue to represent the communities that they're within. I think that's what drives the strength of the schools that we have in our community. Um, I'm very much opposed to big government coming in and telling our local schools how they should be running their own schools. They do a great job, they're full of professionals, and they just need to be given the freedom to be able to actually get it, go on and focus on giving our young people the best education that they deliver and they know how to deliver. And so um, I'll continue to advocate and support them wherever I can. Excellent. Simeon, as an East Aucklander, I mean, exactly the points that you raised, which is why most of us choose to, you know, chose to have come here in the first place into this area and continue to live here. So yes, totally agree with you on that. And now moving on to something else that concerns this area, and, you know, it is something that Venkat and I have also discussed. Both of us have lived around the area. And, you know, as MP for Pakaranga, 
would you like to let us know the status of countdown and pack and save mm. in Highland Park? Why is that place wasted without any activity for the past three years? Look, that's a very um, a very good question, uh, Rushna. And so, for those who don't know the area um, as well as as we do, um, the Highland Park area uh, on Pakuranga Road has two countdowns effectively right next to each other. And it's um, it's always very funny when you drive past and you wonder why there are two countdowns there. Um, and a few years ago, we heard the, the news that uh, Pack and Save had purchased one of the uh, areas where there's a countdown and they were going to put a pack and save there, which of course would provide competition and lower food prices for people here in East Auckland. Um, but unfortunately, it's all stalled. And the local shops which were there before have now been closed, um, and both of the countdowns continue to operate. The reason why is because there's effectively, in the lower countdown, which the one that pack and save has purchased, there is a covenant on that land, which was put there by a countdown when they owned the land earlier, um, to say that only one supermarket could be on that site. And so as long as that covenant is in the in there, uh, Countdown can stop Pack and Save from being able to develop and build a new Pack and Save uh, on that property. And so up until now, they've have been having to go through the court processes to seek to have that covenant overturned. Um, and that is obviously taking time. But I do note that the government has also stepped in and is seeking to change the law to effectively mandate the removal of those covenants, effectively anti-competitive covenants, which um, stop those developments from happening. And so National has been very supportive of that part of the changes that the government is putting forward. And I hope that that will mean that the development happens sooner rather than later, because I think having those empty shops there is an eyesore um, and it needs to change because ultimately we need competition when it comes to uh, food prices here in East Auckland. Apart from that, uh, Simeon, I think public interest should override any private um, interest. It should always be public interest. Well, look, I think well, co covenants are a very difficult area of law, though. That's the problem in that, um, you know, there are covenants all over the place. Uh, yeah. And so unless the government steps in and changes the law, um, the only way for those covenants to be removed has to be through the legal process, and they have to take that into account as to what, whose interests should over, override who else's interests are in place. Um, but I, I think that's why I think it's some good that the, gov the government's actually stepping in and looking at it and going, this is an issue where there is a strong public interest, and, um, and instead of each of those having to go through a legal process, which will cost a lot of money and take a lot of time and chew up court time, yeah. um, it deals with it far more efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Thank you. This is a question I would like to add in as an East Auckland resident. And I think Simeon has, you know, see, the East Auckland community is a very vocal community. You yes. have, you know, your local groups where, you know, you put your concerns, your fears, what's gone well, what's not gone well. And Simeon would have read those as well. And one of the most concerning issues for us at the moment is, you know, we always thought of East Auckland as a very, very safe area. Mm. And we're suddenly seeing this increase in crime. Yes. So in where do you see that heading? How does that get stopped? I mean, what are your views on that? Look, I, I agree with you. We've always seen East Auckland as a safe community. And that's another thing which attracts people out here. Um, but unfortunately, in more recent times, we have seen increases in burglaries, increases in ram raids. There's even been a number of shootings uh, in our community, not many, but a few. And what that does is it does provide uh, a, a serious amount of concern in the community around law and order and, uh, and community safety. And so it's critically important that we support our police um, to be able to crack down on that. Um, you know, I fear for New Zealand going forward because, I mean, yesterday we saw another two people killed by a firearm in West Auckland. I fear for what this unleashes um, in our society and the change that it brings to what it, what law and order looks like. And so I really hope that the government um, and, you know, can actually put some real serious changes in around law and order. And I, I, I fear that they're not taking it seriously. Um, and 
Um, that's one of the reasons why you know I'm a National Party MP because we we do take these issues very seriously. We believe that um, everyone has a right to be safe in their own homes. We're not going to apologise for criminals. Um, and I'm I'm sick and tired of the you know the comments which I see on the media from government MPs and from academics who keep telling me how uh, the gang members or the people perpetrating the violence we just need to understand them better. Well, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are many social issues which need to be dealt with too. But the point is, once someone commits a crime, it's a criminal matter, and they need to be held to account. And um, and that's what I want to see more, more happening. So, look, I work very closely with our local police. Um, I'm the patron of the local Howick Community Patrol, uh, and I and I organise frequently or regularly um, public meetings around law and order so that people can have their say. Um, and also get good information from the police around how they can keep themselves safe. So it's important that everyone takes responsibility themselves, that they report anything that they see of a criminal nature or which is out of which is concerning to them. Um, and that helps the police to be able to have a better picture and how they can address it. But it does need leadership from government. I don't see it at the moment, and uh, we'll continue to be pushing on that issue. Thank you very much. That sounds reassuring. Venkat, would you like to ask anything more? Yes, uh, Simeon, about the compensation that was that was being asked by the CBD businesses because of the disruption that they've mm. gone through. Uh, what what are you hearing? Have they been compensated? And if yes, have they been compensated adequately? Look, that's a good question, and I think. It's also a lesson in terms of these large infrastructure projects that there needs to be uh, a compensation element and in, in built into them um, to make sure that local businesses which are impacted are able to get um, are able to be supported through it because it's a very difficult time when that's happening. Uh, I've looked at some of the numbers and um, it's hard to get an accurate picture around whether that compensation is happening adequately, uh, but it would appear that most of those applications are being processed. I think there is certainly a, a more stricter uh, application of the criteria being applied than what the minister said in his press release, and that is raising some questions by a number of those businesses who are impacted, but don't are uh, not quite close enough in that they may be a few meters away from the construction activity, not right next to it. And so it's um it's certainly something I think that needs to be reviewed and needs to be looked into because ultimately, um, we need to learn from this to make sure that it is being done adequately, appropriately, and that there is adequate compensation taking place for those businesses along the way. Your party has been accused of not having provided any, there's been no provision for such yep. payment when you were in government. Do you agree with that? No, well, I acknowledge that we we didn't we didn't include it at the start. And, I, and as I said, I think it's important that for large infrastructure projects that it is considered as part of the project. Um, the reality is, you know, that was a contract signed a long time ago now. Um, is it something that we'd do differently? Possibly. Um, and, and absolutely in terms of this instance, because actually you've got to make sure those benefits are, are adequately, uh, those, those businesses are adequately compensated. I know Nikki Kay was a very strong advocate as the local MP there. And, um, and so, you know, was it a mistake? Well, the reality is I didn't have all the information at the time. I wasn't the minister, but sh should we have done it? Yes, we should have done it. What about, um, before we close, the the trouble that people are having in getting goods cleared at the Auckland uh, seaport? Mm. Um, have you been in dialogue in your transport um, portfolio with the ports of Auckland? Uh, look, I have been in dialogue with them, um, and I'm visiting them in coming days. Uh, and um, th is this in regards to into regards to which issue was this being kept? Mostly supply chain management, logistics, Simeon. Yes. Uh, most of the shelves in many supermarkets, they are not. Okay. Oh, that's the containers and the containers cleared. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Look, no, I have been in touch, and I've been around the country visiting a number of ports, um, and it is a it is a significant issue in terms of our supply chain. Um, you know, a lot of that is impacted by the uh, uh, the supply chain issues we're seeing around the world because of lockdown policies and that impact that's had on the supply chains over the last number of years and COVID and the restrictions which have been applied. Um, 
locally in Auckland, obviously there's been an issue around the automation project. They've walked back from that, which I think was the right thing to do because uh, Auckland port is critical to Auckland. If Auckland port's, port of Auckland is not working, uh, that's critical to our economy and, and, and so um, it's critical they get that done. And I'm visiting again in, in the coming, coming days to, to talk with them and see where that's going. They have new leadership there, which I think is good. Um, and I look forward to some really positive progress coming out of that. But, you know, it's it's not just Auckland. Port of Tauranga has been becoming busier and busier. They've been trying to extend their port so they can bring in more container, container ships. They tried to get a fast track consent, but the government turned it down. I think that's a real shame. Government has a role to play in terms of making sure that the ports are able to work as efficiently as possible um, and as quickly as possible. And they should be able to grow as well where need be and so those um those consent processes need to be sped up so that we don't just end up in a situation where auckland might be um you know operating inefficiently but then port of tauranga becomes capacity uh and then we're, then where do, then where do those containers go that, that the situation could get worse if the, if the government doesn't step in and actually take some leadership in that oh, thank you simon finally it's not a question that relates to your portfolio, but more as a responsible member of parliament and a citizen of this country. You can mm -hmm. parry the question if you don't want. Would you, as an individual, recommend going back in our settings because of the recurrence of COVID variant now? No, I don't think so. And I think National's been very clear around this. What we want is really clear, simple rules uh, around the management of COVID. Um, I think most New Zealanders have done the right thing. Um, they've been very, you know, we've, 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 the vast majority of New Zealanders have got vaccinated. Um, and uh, the reality is, um, whilst we are seeing a resurgence in COVID, we actually just, we actually also need to make, be doing the right thing from a government's perspective around manage, in, uh, investing in our healthcare system. We locked down in 2020 and we were told that we would lock down so that the government could get the healthcare system ready. We kept locking down and we spent billions of dollars subsidizing businesses and making sure they were able to continue to keep employing uh, people. And, and, and that, was, that was the right thing to do to keep those businesses going uh, because otherwise we would have massive unemployment. But the point of it, that was to buy time so we could get our healthcare system up and running and operating efficiently. But what we ended up doing was spending all that money on lockdowns and the po and, and, and the flow on impact of having to um, support the economy through lockdowns, but we didn't do the investment in our healthcare uh, system. And now we, we see it crumbling around us. We see the absolute lack of nurses. We see the Minister for Immigration and the Prime Minister failing to open up to get nurses into New Zealand so that we're able and doctors so that we're able to actually have the healthcare professionals we need. And now we're seeing the real impact that that's happening. So we've spent all this time locking down, but we've spent nothing from this government. Well, this government's done nothing to actually make sure we've got the healthcare system which can actually respond. Because ultimately, we we need to. The government's decided that we're going to live with the virus. That's the reality. And so to live with it, the government needs to invest in the healthcare system that we need. Um, they've failed to do that. I believe it there, uh, Simeon. Can I request you to give a closing statement um, encompassing what your beliefs are? And then uh, we're so glad that you will be here with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, uh, Venkat and Rushna. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you to everyone who's been listening and watching. And can I just acknowledge um, everyone for their contribution that they make to our great city of Auckland and to New Zealand. And uh, it's, it, it, it is a wonderful country that we live in. and I'm so grateful to have your support and the opportunity to come and speak to you and answer your questions. And I'll be working hard as the MP for Pakaranga um, and also as the National Party Transport and Public Service spokesperson, because I believe in this country. I want to see a change of government, um, but I also want to make sure that we have really good policies which can take New Zealand forward and give everyone the opportunities that they need so they can succeed. And so um, thank you very much. And if you've got any further questions, please. Um, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Always happy to engage and answer questions with people um, face to face, individually, over email, or whatever way. So, thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Simeon, for the time today. And we would look forward to having you back. And I'm sure we would have lots of other questions for you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank everybody. you, Simeon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all to good. all our all listeners good. as well. Thank you, Simeon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Simeon. Simeon missed you at Hancock's today. Oh, I was up there. Oh, really? Yes, I was there about just before 10 30. Ah, oh, no, I went much later. Much oh, later. Oh, you went a bit later. <laughs> no, I'll definitely contact you because I did, do have.